Well, thank you, Fernando, very much, and uh, good evening to everyone. I don't think I've ever had a more dramatic entrance to a, to a group and a presentation. And I would uh, say probably tonight, given that we're in the middle of one of those crazy election years and that uh, there are primaries going on tonight, that there are probably a lot of things we could talk about. But I came here primarily to talk about one thing, and that was part of the introduction and the most recent sort of part of my career, which is co-chair of the Clean and Safe Energy Coalition, Case Energy. Case Energy was formed in 2006. Dr. Patrick Moore, who was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace, and I were asked by the industry if we would be willing to undertake an effort to provide the country with facts about nuclear energy, about where it sits in our overall portfolio, what it means to our country, and whether or not it should be part of our energy profile going forward. Now, I've always found that the American people make pretty good decisions when they've got the facts. And it's a better place to get the facts from people who might know something than, unfortunately, in this day and age, probably the facts about nuclear are best uh, distributed by the Simpsons, because I think it's not Bart, it's the other one who works at a nuclear reactor and glows at night or something like that. So, you know, we figured yes. But Patrick and I came to this for a couple of reasons. One, as governor of the state of New Jersey, we're part of what's known as the PJM grid, and we have nuclear. It's part of our, it's part of our mix. So I've known nuclear for a while. But Patrick and I were both particularly uh, supportive of nuclear power because of what it means to us as a nation in helping to clean our air and on its impact on greenhouse gases. And one of the things that you look at, nuclear is 20% of our energy in the nation today, yet it's 70% of our clean energy. Here in Arkansas, it's about 25% of your energy, but 80% of your clean energy. It's the only form of base power that releases no greenhouse gases or other regulated pollutants while it's producing power. And even with the best that we can do with the forms of renewable that form the rest of the green portfolio, they still need base power behind them. You need 24-7 power, and it's a question of where you're going to get that. Of course, you have to start with an understanding that there are no silver bullets. There is no one easy answer to this. We are going to have a mix of energy. We are always going to need coal. It's not 50% of our power anymore today, which is a, a big change, but it is 49, 48, 49% of our energy, and we're not going to find a substitute for that overnight. That's going to take us a long time. We are going to use oil and gas. But the critical factor here is that we are looking at a 24% increase in energy demand by 2035. Now, for some of us, that may sound like a long time away, but for a utility, it's tomorrow because of the size of the investment that needs to be made, the timing required to get them up and running. We need to make these decisions now. We unfortunately don't have a national energy plan. We haven't had one. And it's time we started acting, our, asking our elected officials what they plan to do about energy and what should the mix be, understanding that there is no one source of energy that's going to answer all our problems. Now, Back in the 1970s, we decided we were going to get out of nuclear energy. We decided that there were too many problematical aspects, and the, we were looking at a Cold War then, and we were kind of thinking nuclear arms, nuclear energy. Those two things are entirely separate. They're different processes. They're not the same thing, but things as will happen um, sort of coalesced at that time and we got out of the business. And so we haven't seen new nuclear come online in this country. So when we started CASE, it was because we were looking at this increase in energy demand and trying to figure out how we were to meet it, and Patrick and I felt that nuclear had a, an important role to play. And so it, we formed a voluntary organization. It started out with a couple hundred people, I guess. It's about 20, 2,800 people now, or 2,800 members, because by a member, it's anything from former and current elected officials at local, fe state, and federal levels to clergy groups, to unions, to chambers of commerce, to healthcare groups. It runs the, the whole gamut. And the purpose behind that is the understanding that there's strength in numbers. And when it comes time for the decision makers to have to decide how they're going to go forward, 
It helps them to have a group of thought leaders behind them saying, you're not crazy to be considering nuclear as part of the overall portfolio. Now, while we got out of nuclear back in the in 1970s, and we haven't brought new nuclear on since 1930, I mean in 30 years, we, are, we have seen a change this year. For the first time, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the first time in 30 years, has now approved two, con the construction of two new nuclear reactors going forward in Georgia, Vogel plants, and two more will soon be uh, given their combined operating licenses in South Carolina. We're just part of a big picture, though. There are over 150 different reactors in, sta in planning stages around the world and 65 actually under construction. But we are part of it. And one of the things that we've done at CASE is tried to look at all the aspects of this that are important when making these kinds of decisions. Obviously for us, for, for Patrick and I particularly, it is about the cleanliness. It is about providing some of that base power in the cleanest way that we possibly can. But we also did a study on the jobs and what it means to a community to have a nuclear reactor. And in fact, they are enormous, they throw off an enormous amount of money for the communities in which they are located. Under construction of a nuclear reactor, you can have anywhere from 1,400 to 1,800 high paying jobs during construction. Um, those are ones that, that take the full gamut of needs because they, you need wiring, you need cement, you need gravel, you need everything. This isn't just for nuclear engineers. This is a whole gamut of, of jobs that are required. And at peak, at peak construction times, it can be as high as 3,500. Once a reactor is up and running, the averages yield four to 700 new jobs during the operation of that plant. Those are good, high-paying jobs that actually, on average, pay about 30% more than a similar job in the local, that local community would be paying. They're career paths. They're things that, that matter. And the average nuclear facility generates approximately $430 million a year in total output for the local community and some $40 million per year in total labor income. So the impact on the local communities are, are not insignificant. And even under that with the two, the, actually the four plants that are being considered, there have already been some 15,000 jobs created by the industry in anticipation. But interestingly enough, for particularly for the uh, Vogel plants, they are creating jobs in some 28 states. That's where the supply chain is. It's much bigger than just that community. It, uh, it, it goes beyond that. The two new plants in Georgia represent the largest construction project ever in that state. This is making a big difference. Um, and once the, the Vogel plants come online somewhere between uh, 2016 and 2017, there'll be approximately 800 permanent full-time jobs that aren't going to go anywhere. And nuclear engineers, by the way, are paid an average salary of over $101,000 a year, which is the uh, third highest form of payment for, a, uh, for an engineer in the country through any jobs. The other thing we looked at is how much does nuclear cost? It's obviously expensive to bring a new nuclear reactor online, but it's expensive, frankly, to bring anything online these days. And the costs are competitive even with wind. Uh, I spent some time with T. Boone Pickens when he was still talking about his wind farm, and at that point in time, he was looking at an estimated cost between 12 and 18 billion dollars. Actually, he was more looking like 16 to 18 billion dollars. The average nuclear reactor you expect to come in somewhere between 8 and 12 billion dollars. This is all with a B. It's big money, but that's just simply to say that you don't get anything for free. And as we look at coal today, we don't have a scrubber that captures carbon, but we've got to do much better at figuring out what we do with carbon, a scrubber that works. And we will, but that's going to make bringing new coal on more expensive. Uh, we know we want further energy independence, so we've, and we've seen the spike in oil up and down, and, and certainly gas prices are now proving to us that we have 
we're paying a lot for our energy and we need to understand that. But once up and running on a per kilowatt basis, nuclear energy is about the least expensive form of power that we have. It's uh, very inexpensive on a per kilowatt basis, which is another consideration. But getting back to the big, to the jobs um, survey that we did, I've often said you should never base a decision on whether or not to support a nuclear reactor based on jobs. To me, it would always be safety. That would be first and foremost in my mind as to how I would decide whether or not I would support a reactor. But it's not unimportant to consider the consequences of the economic infusion. And the interesting thing is there are jobs in the individual, in the in industry today. Over the next five years, 39% of those working in the industry are eligible to retire. That means we need, even if we don't bring on any new nuclear power, we need more people coming into the area. The industry will need to hire approximately 25,000 more workers by 2015. That's just to maintain the current workforce. That's a big challenge for us. And that's something we have to address. Fortunately, the president, um, in his State of the Union, besides calling for more clean and green power, also talked about the need to forge partnerships, particularly between community colleges and universities and the private sector. And a lot of that is going on right now with the energy industry. Um, the nuclear energy industry and the energy industry currently has working relationships with some 38 community colleges around the country. And, and technical colleges, and they're providing scholarships and fellowships. The Department of Energy is also providing scholarships and fellowships. And at the university uh, in Miami, in Southern Miami, Florida Light, Florida Power actually has a program when the students graduate, they walk across the stage and they get not just a diploma, but also a job offer letter. It's guaranteed to them. And, and these are real, real careers. Now, <coughs> The other thing that we look at, obviously, is safety. I mentioned that because that, to me, is number one. And I don't think you can talk about nuclear energy today without doing a look back at Fukushima Daiichi. And what does that mean to us? What, what's happened since then? We are continuing to learn what really went wrong. We are continuing to learn what more we need to do. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the independent watchdog agency that oversees the nuclear industry and actually makes it the most regulated industry that we have in the country and probably the most regulated nuclear industry in the world, did a 90-day study right after Fukushima Daiichi and determined that the U.S. nuclear energy facilities are, are safe for operation. But they still went ahead and they've continued to take a look and to make recommendations where they think, where they think improvements are needed. And the industry itself has taken, has undertaken action on their own to take a look. They've, they've always actually worked pretty well together, the industry and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because they both recognize the importance of safety, that that is, is key to the future. It's one of those areas where what you have to ask people to do is take a look back We've had nuclear energy operating in this country for better than 50 years. We have 104 reactors around the nation. If you look at the safety record of those reactors in this country, the one thing you'll look at is Three Mile Island. What happened at Three Mile Island? Well, Three Mile Island was a meltdown. There was a partial meltdown of the core. If, in fact, the workers at the, at the facility had let the reactor do what it was programmed to do, you wouldn't have had that. But even having said that, nobody was exposed to inordinately high levels of radiation. There have been innumerable follow-up studies of the workers right there on site during that time of crisis, and none of them, there are no cancer clusters, none of them showed inordinately high exposure to radiation, much less the community at large. That's the worst thing that's happened in this country. It was a wake-up call for the industry. Believe me, they took it very seriously. And actually, even after 9-11, we upgraded security uh, a great deal at the various locations. Now, just uh, two weeks ago, the industry came together before being asked by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do more to provide increased backup power should you lose power. 
and allow for uh, the reactor to keep operating even during extended periods of power outage. Those are all important and significant steps, and they're paying a lot of attention to the safety and security here in this country. In fact, the nuclear regulatory agency, industry has been cited by outside business organizations being one of the safest industries in which to work in this country. As far as days lost, they operated about 90% of efficiency, and the days lost to worker injur injury are, are insignificant. They're very small. But then uh, Patrick and I get back to what it means to have clean air. And in, in this state, it's interesting because in 2010, the nuclear facilities here in Arkansas helped the state avoid the emission of 17,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, 11,000 tons of nitrogen oxide, and 11 million metric tons of carbon. Now, to put that, sounds like a lot, and as we know, those are the gases, the gases that form acid rain and low-level ozone and smog and contribute to global warming. They affect people's health very directly. But to put that in perspective, the, just the 11,000 tons of nitrogen oxide avoided by Arkansas's nuclear facilities is the same amount of nitrogen oxide that's released by uh, 572,000 cars. I don't think you want 572,000 more cars on your roads. And those are the kinds of facts and figures that need to be part of the decision-making process when you look at whether or not continuing to have nuclear as part of your overall energy mix makes sense. As the Obama administration pushes for 80% of U.S. electricity to come from clean energy sources by 2035, establishing a national energy policy is more critical than ever. Frankly, establishing a national anything policy would be very helpful in this day and age. I think we'd all like to see that, more decisions being made, but it is, it's important. We can't keep putting this off. One of the things that we did at CASE was to establish a roadmap uh, for the future. We indicated the things that have to happen if we are going to have a robust industry, if we're going to be able to move forward. The first component was energy security. Uh, I mean, I think that's a given in most discussions. Nearly two-thirds of the 20 million barrels of oil that we consume every day comes from overseas, and much of that from places that don't like us a whole lot. We want to do something about that, and that's where nuclear has a role to play. We use less and less of it. We use less than 10 percent um, to produce electricity. It's the transportation se sector that's a huge component and consumer of that. But the auto industry is trying to meet the demands of reducing our dependence on foreign oil by moving to electric cars. That's well and good, but it gets us right back to the energy source because the electric cars are only as clean as the energy used to produce the power that they soak up. So we have to still do something about our need for increased energy. I'm all for lowering the emissions with the electric vehicles, but we still have to do something that is going to ensure that those electric vehicles in and of themselves, the power source on which they rely, are clean, and they're not doing more damage to our environment. So we have to understand that we're going to be making investments because the federal government is also looking at the need for improvement to the grid uh, to just to sustain, even if we bring on only renewable forms of green power, such as wind and solar. Our grid, our infrastructure to handle power in this country is old, and in many places it needs a lot of work. They are looking at how we deal with that, um, at cost-effective, a way to bring cost-effective clean energy to the public in order to keep our economy growing. Because you cannot have a thriving economy if you don't have reliable, affordable energy. That's, that's just a fact of life, and it's where we get it from. The second big obstacle that we pointed out that, that needs addressing is financing. Again, that's as true for nuclear as it is for any forms of the renewable powers. They're going to require loan guarantees. 
And right now, the nuclear industry feels we're, as we've been working in conjunction with the wind power industry to get Congress and to get the Department of Energy to continue to have a robust form of, of loan guarantees, a robust loan guarantee program. I mean, the U.S. The US um, power industry is on the verge of a $1.5 trillion expansion. There is no one company that has the access to that kind of capital. And we're going to need to all play a part in that in order to move things along. And so as what Case Energy is called for is a continued discussion on this subject because we've got to start to bring some of it to closure. I mean, the electric power research industry has estimated that it's going to take at least 45 new nuclear reactors to reach the goal that the president has set out of a 42 percent cut in greenhouse gases. And that's actually in the House legislation, the Markey bill. Maintaining nuclear energy at, at the current 20 percent is going to require uh, building a new reactor each year starting in 2016 because we're going to have to get to 20 to 25 new units by 2035, if we're going to keep it just at the 20 percent that we have today of nuclear reactors. So there's a clear gap between today's nuclear energy capacity and what's needed to meet our energy and environmental goals. And the government is going to have to play a part in that. And they have to continue to have that discussion. But obviously, as I mentioned earlier on, there's a great need for jobs. And workforce training is another part of what we've identified as critical to moving this, energy, this industry or any part of the energy industry forward. It's ironic that at a time when we have high unemployment, there are so many in industry that will tell you they can't find enough qualified people to fill their job needs. And that is certainly true. The nuclear industry is working hard to establish relationships with colleges and universities, as I mentioned before, to ensure that we have the trained workers. Now, we are also getting them from our nuclear navy, which has been taking nuclear power around the world for quite some time and doing that very safely, and the unions are stepping up to help provide for that. But there is enormous opportunity here um, to bring people and get people to the skill level that they need to have, understanding that any time you have a nuclear reactor, even once it's up and running, you still need, you're going to need electricians. You're going to need people who are going to take day-to-day -day care of it. It runs the full scope of the needs that you find in, in any other industry. It's not just nuclear engineers at the high end of it, but they still pay very well. There are a potential of some 40 to 70,000 new jobs in the nuclear industry horizon, and we've got to be prepared to meet it. And that, again, is going to take involvement of not just the federal government, but of private institutions and the utilities themselves. Everyone and state government, everyone's going to have to be involved if we are going to meet this need in a way that makes sense and actually guarantees our future. The final part of the, what we need to deal with, and it's something that it's a question I get wherever I go, is what do we do with the spent nuclear rods? What do we do with the waste? Well, I like to start off the discussion by saying, by defining the problem. We've had nuclear power in this country for some 50 plus years. We have 104 reactors around the country. If you took all the waste, all the spent rods from those 104 reactors and put them all together end to end, you'd fill up one football field to the height of the goalposts. It's not something the size of Maine that most people assume immediately when they hear spent nuclear rods. They are now stored on site around the country in underground holding ponds or above ground reinforced concrete bunkers, steel concrete bunkers. They are safe. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has come back. It's relicensed most, if not all of them by now, for another 30 years. But that's not optimal. That's not what we want. We don't want 95 different sites with spent nuclear rods. And the Congress recognized this. And the Congress said we should have one national repository. And they even said it should be in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. And we as taxpayers have actually spent literally billions of dollars getting Yucca Mountain ready. However, um, what's holding us up is not technical, it's political. And as long as Harry Reid is still head of the Senate and comes from Nevada, Yucca Mountain is going to be a heavy lift. I, for one, think we're still going to ultimately get it done because we've just spent too much time. There's been too much study 
and too much work done on it to walk away from it. But having said that, the president appointed a panel to come up with solutions to this, to take another look. And they've come back and, and outlined some plans to move forward. Um, they will, they're talking about probably two sites at least and different ways of, of handling it. So we're getting a roadmap out there and, and we at CASE encourage them to continue that discussion. That's another part of what's got to happen. Um, and Congress has got to act. We've got to act on the recommendations. Start to move this process forward or we're never going to get to the end of the day. The other part of what we need to be doing as a country is something that actually we started and then France took over when we got out of the nuclear business and that's reprocessing. In those nuclear rods, in those spent nuclear rods, you still have between 95 and 97 percent fissionable material or usable energy. With reprocessing or recycling, you can get that down to 2 to 3 percent, which means you have a much smaller amount that you've got to deal with anywhere, and the shelf life is much less, much shorter time period that you have to worry about what's there. It's highly enriched plutonium, but both France and Japan, who do the bulk of the reprocessing understand and have figured out how to ensure that that could never be used for weapons grade. It never would be weapons grade material to make it safe. So there's a lot that's been happening in the nuclear field. There's a lot still to happen. CASE, as I said, is a, uh, it's a volunteer organization. Anybody can join cleansafeenergy.org is the website. And it's we don't ask our members to do anything. It doesn't cost anything to join. It's it really getting back to the theory that there is strength in numbers, that the people that have to make the decisions about how we go forward to meet our energy futures and our demands need to see that there are thought leaders in their communities and across the country who say you're not crazy to be considering this as part of it. But it's only a part. We can and must do much better with conservation we will figure out a way to store solar and wind eventually, and we will figure out how to make them economical. We're not there yet. We're not going to get there by 2035. We're going to need all of that. And we're going to, oh yes, still have coal, and we're going to have oil and gas. And we have to understand as a country that much as we like the silver bullet, much as we like to be told there's one thing we can do and that'll solve all the problems, and then we are the best in the world at getting that one thing done, there is no one thing. And so for me, and I believe I can speak for Patrick on this, what we have been trying to do with CASE is say, just inform yourself. Go on the website. Look, understand we're pro-nuclear. So go find another site that isn't and match it up. But look at the facts. Look at the facts to decide whether or not this makes sense for your community. Look at all the facts, all the things to be considered, and then make that decision. Again, I want to thank you very much for having invited me here tonight. I'd be happy to answer questions, but thank you for being here. All right. We'll take questions, and please wait till the microphone gets to you. Yes, right over here. We have yes for you, coming right at you. Uh huh. And just wait for the microphone, please. Well, I have several, but I'll ask him one, just one. Um, what is Mr. Reed's problem with the storage facility? Is it based on science or is it just strictly fear? No, it's, it's politics now. It's become kind of a it's, a, it's something if you're from Nevada, you have to be against it if you're on the national scene. Interesting thing is if you go to the, to the communities around Yucca Mountain, if you go to the uh, counties around Yucca, there's several of them would love to have it because they see it as a, it's going to make money and they know they think they believe it's going to be perfectly safe. So it's not everybody who's against this. And, and Harry Reid, by the way, is not against nuclear power. He's not against nuclear energy. He just it's a NIMBY syndrome. And it's kind of a, a rite of passage if you're from Nevada, especially on the on the national stage. I don't think it's only Harry Reid that's involved in no. being against it because as I remember, people didn't want the waste coming through their states. And, yes. there, and there were a lot of uh, protests and things as, as the waste went. So it's, it's a general Well, but not, fear. not in, in fairness, not a lot right. because there had been no routes planned. And, you know, we do move nuclear waste around this country every day. 
Um, we forget that we use a lot of it in very positive ways in our hospitals and other places. So it does get moved around, but you're right. There were concerns that there would be. There hadn't been because there were no roots, but there were concerns that there would be in the local communities. But again, uh, when you go back to people and say, look, we move nuclear waste all the time around the country, there's not going to be anybody advertising when it's removed. And oh, by the way, they're going to have to make very, very sure that they have figured out a way to make it absolutely safe. But the big thing that has stopped the consideration at the federal level is the opposition of the Nevada delegation, but particularly with Harry Reid being the head of the Senate. It makes it very difficult, and I understand that for the President. Yes, right here. You have a question? Uh, Governor, uh, we are from New Jersey originally. Uh, when you were in office, did you run across any specific problems with either the Salem nuclear reactor or Oyster Creek? Because there have been some stories that they were in need of some degree of repair. And could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, no. And even as my time as president of the Board of Public Utilities, which I was for the state of New Jersey for a couple of years, I did not. I mean, there are always ongoing issues at any nuclear, at any manufacturing facility, at any kind of big facility where you're constantly doing maintenance and upkeep. But I never saw anything come before us, either when I was governor or at the BPU, that said that there was any kind of leakage that threatened public health, that there was anything of concern to a broader community. There were ongoing, as there are in any upkeep issues with, with any facility of any sort. And uh, those were being taken care of in the routine repair and maintenance operations of the facilities, but nothing that uh, was brought to my attention as being a, a concern to the greater community. Any of the students have a question? Yes, sir. In the case of reprocessing, um, you said it does highly enrich the uranium. Uh, what is the actual safety measures that would be taken? Because obviously you cannot yeah. keep it in a, a storage facility that you could the other ones. Right. I can't answer that because I'm not a scientist. I do know that in both France and Japan, they have worked out the way to introduce other compounds into the waste to ensure that it is not, first of all, they reduce the, the lifetime of it to about 100 years instead of 10,000, which is what you're talking about now with the spent rods that we've got. And they ensure that it can never be used as weapons grade. It was not a weapons grade material at the end of that, but I can't tell you exactly what they do. Aside from the loan guarantees, what is the role of the government in uh, getting new nuclear plants built and running? Well, really, you know, it, it is the role for government in nuclear is to, first of all, to establish an energy plan. We need an energy plan, and it ought to be saying, what are the goals we really want? And I believe those goals should be clean, affordable, reliable energy, however it comes. So the market can determine how we're going to get there, but they shouldn't be picking winners. Uh, in the discussion, for instance, today on energy, when you talk about renewable, that immediately leaves nuclear out because it's based on uranium, and uranium is a finite resource. I mean, we happen to have plenty, and where we do import it, we import it from Canada and Australia, and they're not out to get us, the moment anyway. Um, and so it is a it is something that takes such a tiny amount of uranium to make a whole lot of power that it is a, a source that we're going to have for a long time. But it's an issue that uh, we need to, to move forward. And, that, and to do that, you need to have support from the government saying, yes, nuclear is going to be part of our future. Because the problem is access to capital for the utilities that want to bring nuclear to the fore. And as you can imagine, when we got out of the business in, in back in the 70s, it made it very problematical for anyone to go and say, I'd like to have a, a, loan, a loan line of credit for $18 billion, $14 billion, $12 billion, $8 billion. Anytime you put a B on anything, that's going to strain the resources. And so what they're looking for is for the federal government to say, yes, this is part of an overall portfolio. We're not determining that it's going to be nuclear. We're not going to put all our, our eggs in this basket, but we want clean energy. And that comes under the heading of clean energy. So let them be able to compete. And what actually uh, Secretary Chu has done, which I think is very smart, he does have a loan guarantee program, and there is a pot of money. And what he's basically said is that no one industry can take more than a certain percentage of that. So you don't 
you hear the argument, I hear the argument uh, often from environmentalists that, well, what you give to nuclear, you're taking away from wind or solar. That's simply not the case. And actually, if you look over the history of, of loan guarantees and loans to the energy industry, coal and gas have absorbed far more than nuclear. And nuclear and wind are just about even right now in what they need, which is why actually the wind power people are working with the nuclear industry on getting loan guarantees out there. And that's really what the government has to do. But then, of course, you have that's to, to keep it going. And as I mentioned, you also want to see the government continue to encourage um, training programs, on offering ability for young people to find career paths in the nuclear industry at all the various levels. But then, of course, you have to have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And that's the, the big umbrella that has to ensure the safety and security of nuclear. And you need to have a government regulatory watchdog agency. Uh, and it's not that the nuclear industry itself doesn't take these issues very seriously. They do. But I don't believe you should ever turn it over entirely to them because they also have other interests. And uh, you want to make, you want to be able to assure people that there's somebody who's looking out for them. And you want to be able to assure people that there is someone who is going to go back and verify. Now, as Reagan said, trust but verify. Uh, Laura Crosby. Oh, Brittany has it. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm a class seven student here at this school. Thank you again for coming. Uh, my question is, given that you're advocating for a higher reliance on uh, nuclear energy and that it is a non-renewable energy source, um, how long can it be sustained? And especially if you're asking for it to, I guess, grow in the future. Yeah. Uh, with there hundreds of years of uranium left? Again, it takes such a small amount of uranium, particularly compared to coal in producing power, that uh, we really do, we, we don't mine it much here. We have a lot of resources, but for various reasons we have not. So we do import from Canada and from Australia. But there's several, is the last I saw, there were several hundred years worth of uranium left. Uh, I don't know what we can say for coal, oil, and gas. I mean, all of those are finite resources. And so uh, we're going to have to be creative as we move forward. And that's why I say it's going to take a little bit of everything. But as we look at our needs, even in the, in the renewables, we're going to need uh, rare earth metals for solar panels. We're going to need, you know, we, we, it takes things to build windmills. And so not to the same degree, obviously, but we still have to understand that they're all part of that mix. John, you had a question. Hello. Uh, I'd like for you to comment on two international things. One is the reverse, apparent reversal, of course, of some European countries in terms of nuclear en energy. And the second, the one you mentioned earlier, was the, the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Obviously, events in Iran have surfaced that mm -hmm. potential connection again yep. and how that impacts on our current. Well, let me answer the second one first, because that's one of the interesting things that the International Commission, that's why they can go in and tell whether Iran and Iraq are actually building nuclear weapons or nuclear power, because they are different processes. They require some different things. And you can tell very quickly, if you have access to those facilities, if you really have access, which way they're going, which direction they're going, because there's some things you do to produce. And don't ask me what they are. Again, I'm not the scientist. I can't tell you what specific. We, we do have people here who know a lot more than I do about this. But uh, there are things that you do to produce nuclear weapons that you don't do and you don't need in a nuclear power facility. So that's why they can go in. And if they have access to these facilities, that's why they can, with pretty good assurance, tell you whether or not they're moving in a direction of nuclear weapons or nuclear power because they are very different. Now, the question about the, uh, the Europe particularly, it's, a, it's an interesting one, because after Fukushima Daiichi, particularly in Germany, you had uh, Chancellor Merkel who said, that's it, we're going away from nuclear. Interestingly enough, Germany, while it had some nuclear power, always sort of said it didn't like nuclear power, but it bought most of its power from France, and France is 80% nuclear, so there was a little bit of game playing there. And she had also lost two by-elections to the Green Party and was getting worried politically when she did this. However, now they have found themselves in a position, their nuclear reactors are located primarily in the Ruhr Valley, which is their industrial section. They are finding that in order to meet the needs of that industrial heartland, they're going to have to spend a lot more money on power. And as an early signator to Kyoto, well, you know, in that first round, they are going to blow through their allowances on greenhouse gases because they're going to have to be using oil and coal. 
and they don't know how to get around that yet. So now they're starting to pull back from their pullback. They're starting to reassess. Same thing with Great Britain. Uh, France never was really there. They kind of played with it, but they're too reliant on, on nuclear energy anyway, and they have a very good safety record. They've, they've had nuclear. They are, as I say, almost 80% nuclear, and they've been very comfortable with it. So they haven't had the same kind of, of reaction. But the other countries are finding that what it's doing to them is putting themselves in direct conflict to the promises they made under Kyoto. Okay, we got one of the more. students up here with a question. Wait for the microphone, she'll bring it to you. Right up here, Jeannie, right in the front. Since most nuclear power plants have been built 40, 50 years ago, what do we plan to do with these nuclear power plants as they continue to age? Do we rebuild them or continue modifying them? That's going to be up to the utility, whether they actually modify and how much modification they can do and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has to approve that to make sure they're safe and to make sure they're operable uh, or whether it makes more sense for them to build new ones. Now it's interesting that most of the uh, proposed new reactors that are being talked about and including the, the ones that have been approved are being located on sites where you already have nuclear reactors. They had early in many, we find this in many sites around the country, they had pre-approval to put in more reactors than they did. Uh, back when they were first building them. So they don't have to go through the site preparation part of it. And for some of them, they will decide then eventually to retire the aging nuclear plant. The other thing that's happening, the change, a big change in the industry, which actually is very important and should be important for all of us to consider, of the 104 we ha reactors to we have today around the country, about 95 of them use different technologies, even within the same utility. You couldn't train somebody on one nuclear reactor here and then move them to your other nuclear reactor in another state necessarily because it was probably a different technology. Well, that, the industry figured out that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the learning curve was a little tough. Uh, it was also tough for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It made no sense. There are today around the world about five technologies being used. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has approved the ones for Vogel or the Westinghouse AP-1000. That will probably be the major one. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission will never pick a winner. They will never say that it's these two that we're going to use throughout the country. But the industry has come to the understanding they don't want 95 different types of reactors. They want one or two or three probably at the most. And so that's what we're going to see as a change in the industry, which is also going to go a long way to increasing the safety and making sure that they're going to be easier to, to manage, to oversee, because you'll know what to look for. It won't be something different at every facility and easier to train people as well. I know that several of you have more questions, and I hope that you will come forth uh, and, and visit with Governor Whitman. But right now, I just want to thank you, Governor, for being with us. It was a great program. Thank you all for coming, and we appreciate thank you. Being with us.